people, we've all seen ancient aliens and heard of the Anunnaki, but what if there's more to the story? What if, in fact, the story remains the biggest secret ever kept from humanity and is the source for all of our strife, the manipulative religions of the world, the duality and conflict between light and dark, our holographic reality, the secret rituals of the elite, the symbolism we see woven throughout our culture, and pretty much everything else? Well, you just might start seeing it that way when we speak with today's guest, Gerald Clark. He graduated right here in San Diego at UCSD in computer engineering and also in MS Electrical Engineering where he was a PhD student for three years. His career took him all over the world and sparked an interest in man's earliest technologies and accomplishments as well as the cuneiform tablets of the Sumerians. Well, that interest became a passion and he authored the book The Anunnaki of Nuburu, Mankind's Forgotten Creators, Enslavers, Destroyers, Saviors, and Hidden Architects of the New World Order. And he's now one of the leading authorities on the Anunnaki story throughout history and right into the modern times. It's going to get weird and I've never been more ready. Gerald, my man, welcome to THC. Hey, thanks, buddy. I'm glad to be here. I want to say welcome to all your listeners, and uh, I'm really excited about doing the show with you. I know you're up to speed. Yeah, man, this is a real pleasure. I've heard you on Coast to Coast and a couple other shows out there in this wheelhouse, and I'm glad I could get you on. We've talked about the Anunnaki before with guys like Michael Tellinger and James Gilliland, but an understanding of the story and the names is so crucial to getting the context of our situation today. So I'm going to give you the floor a little bit. I know you've done this a thousand times, but start us off with your version of the Anunnaki story so that we all know the aspects that are most important and relative to understanding how we ended up in this mess. Okay, buddy. Um, I know you know I've done this before, and, and I'll try to do it uh, in a sequence that makes sense to people. Yeah. Um, there was a race of beings that are reported in the Sumerian documents. They call them the Anunnaki. Anu na Ki. Turns out those two names, Anu and Ki, show up in the genealogy table that I did. One of them was our uh, was from another planet called Nibiru, and he was the king of Nibiru at the time this went down. And uh, the Ki turns out to be the name of Earth, and also the being that he had a child with that had a very very large influence on our history. So how did it start? According to them, they had uh, problems with their atmosphere during their perihelion with the sun, radiation was destroying their atmosphere, creating holes, kind of like what we see on our Earth. They had uh, an opportunity to fix that. They realized that putting a transition metal in, its, uh, in an ionized form in the atmosphere would shield radiation and they came perihelion with our sun. Uh, they weren't originally in our solar orbit, but were trapped into our orbit according to the Enuma Elish account, which was their Babylonian epic of creation. We can, we'll get into that in, uh, in a little bit. So at that point, Anu's the king. He's got uh, two kids. One's name is Enki. He's a chief scientist, uh, explorer. Doesn't look like much of a bureaucrat uh, in terms of running operations, but he was very skilled. Uh, and he also had another son named Enlil, who was the son of uh, Anu and Ki, or Arash. That was her name. So it turns out that Ki was Anu's half-sister, and that's why Enlil plays such a role. So there's Enlil and Enki. Okay, keep those in mind. Mm -hmm. One's uh, like a bureaucratic commander. That's Enlil. The other one's like a wild-eyed scientist that, that knows no limits, okay, <laughs> including genetic limits. Okay, so he sent his son Enki to the Earth to verify that there was enough uh, gold that they could ionize. Some people have asked me, well, why didn't they just make it if they were so advanced? It's a good question. Uh, and we can look to some of the alchemy that went on with one of their progenitors, and we can talk about that. Okay, so Enki was sent to the Earth to verify that there was gold uh, here that they could use to ionize in their atmosphere to shield them from radiation. Um, this is about 450,000 years ago, uh, quite a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Landed in the Persian Gulf area, built the city of Eridu, E-R-I-D-U, which you can go online and look at with Google Earth or what have you. Very first city on the planet if it's 450,000 years old. They started looking for gold in the Persian Gulf, couldn't get it fast enough, got vectored to Africa by Anu. So Enki left the Mesopotamian region, went to South Africa, where we now know there are thousands of gold mines that are owned by the Anglo-American Mining Corporation and the several others. But the, the latest is the Viking Mining Corporation that just set up their operation in Ghana. Go check out the largest deposit in West Africa where the Ebola virus is breaking out is right there. Hmm. Okay, so, so Enki's getting gold in South Africa. He brought about 50 workers with him. They call them the Igigi, I-G-I-G-I. That's what they show up in the Atrahasis account. Um, and they did a, a lot of the work. They were dredging rivers, building structures, mining uh, underground. And they were worked pretty hard. And after 
a very long time, and they tracked time in accordance with the time it took for their planet to go around the sun, which they called a shar, S-H-A-R, 3,600 years. You know, and in, that, in actuality, when you have a planet that goes around that far, it could be off by plus or minus 50 years, according to our modern analysis of a, how a planet travels around an elliptical orbit. So that being said, it was, you know, about, a shar is about 3,600 years. Uh, they've been working in these mines for many of those. So we have a time marker now, 450,000 years ago. And also, the end of the Sumerian account list where the flood occurred was about 241,000. So if you subtract that off of this 450,000, you can see how long they were there working. Okay, Because it wasn't but 600 years after Noah became the king where he actually uh, experienced the flood. So you can back up from the 241,000 years ago and see that there were multiple floods. Okay, mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that. So uh, Enki's getting gold in South Africa. He's got some, enough workers to kind of wet his appetite. They don't have enough of a labor force to do what needs to be done, underground mining tools and so on and so forth, because they originally planned on getting it, looks like, colloidally out of the ocean. Um, so with that said, uh, the uh, GG miners finally had enough. They were led by one of their fellow gods, as he was called in the Atrahasis in the first tablet. His name was Allah. Surprise, surprise. Where do we hear that name these days under the sign of the crescent moon? So he riles them up, tells them to burn their tools. They go to his father's house to ask for relief. Turns out it's Enlil. And you ask yourself, what's Enlil doing in Africa if Enki was sent down there? Well, about 5,000 years later, after Enki got here, Enlil was dispatched to kind of take care of some of the bureaucratic functions that included bond, heaven, earth, communicating with the Buru, which was going on up in the Mesopotamian area near Sippar and Nippur which was their uh, landing port and their mission control center, respectively. Okay? So Enlil shows up down in Africa, probably tr bringing his bureaucratic know-how down there to beat the workers into submission and get them to produce faster. Okay, Because <laughs> they, they surround his house and say, hey, where's the relief? Mm -hmm. He comes out and goes, uh, uh, after Nusku, the, the guard t tells him what's going on. He's like the liaison. He goes, okay, well, let's just kill one and send them back to work. They'll get the message. And about this time, Anu has been summoned, his, his father, and Enki has been summoned, and Belit Ili, or Ninma, who is Isis, was summoned. So, uh, And several members of this supposed council all of a sudden get together and go, hey, we've got to talk about this uprising, we've got to do something. So now, all of a sudden, you realize this, these ancient astronauts had an organized council of 12, six men, six women. They all had their ranks. We, I listed them in my book. And... Uh, they had cast lots about this time when all, all, all the work with mining was going on, and, and it turns out that uh, Enki got Africa, uh, and little stayed in Mesopotamia, supposedly, but here he was in Africa in this account. Anu went back to Nibiru, and uh, Nin Hartsaw, uh got the um, Sinai Peninsula assigned to her, and Nanano got to sign the Indus Valley. So they kind of separated these advanced team that were here, because apparently they, they didn't get along very well. Okay, so they revolt. They ask for relief. Enlil says, kill one or go, and get back to work. He was a, he was a task, slave taskmaster, quintessential slave taskmaster. Um, <laughs> at that point, Anu interrupts, says, oh, so we've been hearing the noise. Sounds like they're overworked. Enki agrees, whether he's butt-kissing his dad or he really agrees that they've been overworked. He agrees with him and says, we need to find him relief. At this point, the council meets. Uh, they talk about tools or producing primitive workers out of some uh, genetic material, and they opted to go the genetic route. And Enki and Nen Hartzog were dispatched to, to Africa to go do their thing. They knew about the bipedal hominids on South Africa. They chose one, multiple ones probably, according to the account. They messed around with all kinds of animal DNA, chimeras, trying to produce a worker that could follow their instructions. But obviously not encroach on the, oh, I don't know, the consciousness, the lifestyle, the mental capabilities, the, the, the dimensionality that the Anunnaki had. These are supposed mm -hmm. to be just slaves. So, so that said, you know, that, imagine being a scientist and given the constraints to try to come up with some being that you can control. It's not going to get out of control, yet it can intelligently do enough of the complex things that you as an advanced race want, wants done, <laughs> right? right? It reminds me of Zog the Caveman uh, with the uh, with the alien encounter on uh, YouTube, so those funny claymations that you know the alien trying yeah. to get through to Zog, and he's just he's just mortifyingly stupid. He just can't get it. Well, you know yeah. they had that issue too, so they're like, okay, well, how much intelligence do we got to give them to make them understand what we want them to do? 
And so Anki and uh, his sister, his half-sister, who was the medical officer, got the task to do this. And they succeeded. And Nen Hartzog reports to the council, I have completed what you've asked, blah, blah. It reminded me of a TPS report from, from the office. You know, Even she had to report to her <laughs> boss that, hey, uh, I got it done. <laughs> Status yeah. report, here we go. So they got it done. And uh, after messing around with the genetics, uh, you know uh, when you mix a horse with a donkey, you get a mule, right? And it can't, it, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's impotent. Well, the same was true with these beings. Uh, they weren't able to procreate, and it needed, they needed a genetic upgrade in order to uh, do that. Well, so here we are. The, the GG miners got relief. Now, what are they doing all of a sudden, right? They're not mining anymore. Well, apparently they were also called the Watchers in the Lost Book of Enoch, and they were in charge of low-Earth orbiting craft, satellites, watching the Earth to determine its environmental state to inform the Anunnaki so they knew what was going on. They didn't want some... Earthquake happening, a tsunami bringing in a you know a flood and wiping them out in the Mesopotamian plain, which it was prone to do. Huh. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so at this point, they get their relief. They produce their primitive worker, and that's where you and I come in through this in vitro fertilization and and uh, putting it in, having uh, Nin Hartsaw carry the baby to term, and it looked like a full ninth month term. It wasn't accelerated. Maybe later they genetically augmented their workers to be have an accelerated life, but it looks like their normal gestation period is the same one that we have. Uh, we have some, so so here we are. We're like faced with the idea of these ancient astronauts genetically augmenting a life form that was on this planet that just happened to be bipedal and made it just smart enough that it could do their pitting. So hmm. that you know that's a that's a real shock for most people to find that out. So how do we know this is myth and not or is true and not just myth? Right. So that's you know that's where uh, we start looking to the various written sources that we have about our history, whether it's the Bible or the Koran or it's the Nag Hammadi Gospels, the Lost Book, whatever it is your source is. You start synthesizing all those, and you realize that some advanced beings, according to most of these cultures, came here and d- dispensed technology and civilizing aspects to these cultures to make them who they were. And the, and the Sumerians were the, were the penultimate example of that, having hundreds of first show up in their culture pl- practically overnight. So let's not skip too far forward. Okay. <laughs> so now, now um, the humans are in doing all the slave labor. And one of the really interesting things to think about is if this advanced scientist designed these beings to do these tasks, one of the primary features he would have had to design in them is that a control mechanism so that he could control an uprising because that was the reason they replaced the GG in the first place. So that's where uh, some important questions come in, and I think we're going to talk about those later relative <laughs> to the electromagnetic spectrum in our consciousness, right? Right, so, right. So, uh, <laughs> okay, so, uh, so now we know that... Uh, the, the Gigi slaves did the mining. They revolted. We replaced them. And uh, next thing you know, um, these humans, after they get uh, in, uh, genetically upgraded by the next being that shows up, which to me is kind of my hero. This is the caduceus bearing son of Enki, whose name is uh, Ningshita. Now, it turns out he has multiple incarnations. I'm just going to focus on a couple because he ends up, it ends up getting crazy when you realize what they were capable of. Okay, so... First of all, we probably ought to put a stake in the ground right now to understand that they had also known as names, and the reason they did that is because they lived so long. They they were immortal to the primitive workers who only had a lifespan of 120 years. These beings mm-hmm. measured their years in shars, so one shar for them was one year. Well, that's 3,600 years to us. <laughs> so imagine you're 100 years Jesus. old. They're, they're 36,000 years old. You know, right? right, that's hard to even wrap your so, head around. Wow. Well, so now keep that in mind. Let's wrap our head around it, because in the Sumerian Accounts list, where Eridu was the very first city where kingship was lowered, all of a sudden, I just told you, Enki built the first one called Eridu when he showed up. That was his Earth Station 1 or his home far away that he was using as an outpost while they were looking for gold in the Persian Gulf. Okay? So... Uh, this is really, really fascinating. So now, after a period right. of time, they couldn't procreate. This Ningshita being shows up, who turns out to be the son of Enki, and he's involved in doing a genetic upgrade on them. This is your biblical story of taking the material from Adam's rib and creating the Eve. Well, it actually was Ningshita upgrading them so they could procreate. 
They get taken off back to Eridu, where the Garden of Eden has been proven with the four rivers that originated there. You can see this from satellite now. The Tigris, Euphrates, the the Pishon, and the I think Galphon is what it is. I can't pronounce the last one. But uh, there were four rivers that came together, Bab, uh, Garden, of e- uh, Garden of Eden. Well, there it is in Eridu, just like Enki's hanging garden. I mean, that's where it was, his medicinal garden. So these beings are taken there to get monitored to see if they can produce offspring to meet the labor requirements. Enki and Enlil there, they're probably a little sensitive about what uh, design requirements have been put into them. Imagine Enki hasn't divulged the degree of scientific nature of what he's done with these beings. Hidden, mm-hmm. hidden code so that there's a latency in our DNA sensitive to timing of the universe. So you could wake up potentially. How would Enlil know that unless he was a geneticist? Those kind of things. So think about how sophisticated this being is, okay? who Mm -hmm. gave us intelligence, gave us a limited lifespan, according to his writings of 120 years, and he also gave us the spirit of one of the sacrificed uh, Ejiji, I believe, whose name was uh, Yawela, and transferred the energy into our body. So is this why we have this destructive consciousness? Because we were the consciousness of one of the Ejiji that got sacrificed, and they were kind of the slaves in the first place? Probably. Hmm. Uh, Oh, yeah. So anyway... So now let's let's come back to the Garden of Eden. Um, Enki and Enlil are there, and they're monitoring these these Adamus, the Adop, the Adapas that were originally created. And there were so you have to understand there were multiple versions, but the the ones that were augmented to procreate were brought there to be watched. Um, Enlil clearly is a little suspicious of his brother because these pe- these beings can get out of control. They start procreating, and all of a sudden you got a genetic war in your hands. His offspring <laughs> outnumbered me by you know umpteen to, to three or whatever it is. And he's a bureaucrat and a commander, and he probably thought like that, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So at this point, uh, he's uh, he's warning these uh, beings. Enlil is calling himself God in the Genesis account, not to eat anything in Enlil, Enki's garden in particular the plant of the knowledge of good and evil. He doesn't want them to know they're enslaved, so they revolt, right? That would be a reason a bureaucratic commander would tell somebody not to do something. Instead mm-hmm. of telling them, hey, look at all this wonderful stuff you can partake of in here, and, you know, these are these over here are kind of, they're not good for you. So No, he gave them the severe message. You eat this, you'll die, right? That's what he said. So right. and then, then, his, then Enki shows up and says, no, actually, you won't die. He tells him the truth. This is a scientist talking, right? You'll actually take on the consciousness of the knowledge of good and evil like we have. Clearly not what Enlil wanted with his slave species coming from his brother. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the real story. You know, and they, so they leave the garden. I won't get into all the details of what happened. Uh, the Adapa actually became Enki's chief priest at uh, Aridu, and he taught him just about everything known to a man on the planet. Really quite an interesting story. Um, <clears throat> but at that point... Uh, they started proliferating. They could procreate now. And all of a sudden, I mean, imagine how many people there could be if it's unfettered in 600 years. The United States <laughs> right. has been around for 200 years, and all of a sudden we got 300 million people. How many were there after 600 years? See what I'm saying? Yeah, who, yeah. who knows? Who knows? Their lifespan may be a little short or whatever, but uh, there could have been a lot of them, millions and millions, okay? Well, at this point, Enlil is complaining in the Atrahasis account that uh, the noise of mankind is too much. And he calls this Anunnaki Council, the same one that agreed to produce them, to come in and uh, start culling them. He's complaining about the noise, and he wants them gone. And somehow he gets his way, and he's allowed, and this ought to be the most dastardly thing you ever find out. He was allowed to introduce a devastating disease twice into the population to kill them. Wow. How how is that? <laughs> I mean, now look around at what's going on in the world. Yeah, we we, we would do that to animals too, but also of course right now with us is the Ebola thing. Oh, it's not just Ebola. I mean, you you look at the history of disease on this planet, everything from the Black Death, MERS, SARS, Ebola, chikungunya, that one's not terrible, but maybe it sets you up for another one to wipe you out. It's devastating. It's really mm-hmm. devastating. HIV. <laughs> it goes on and on and on. Do you think there's an Anunnaki connection to these more modern disease outbreaks? Well, let's, let's, let's start asking this. So after 600 years, he introduced disease, famine, plague, and cut off the food supply, water supply, and after six years, they're eating each other. That's pretty destructive. He wanted right. them all gone. Then he, you know, oh, there's a flood coming, whether it was caused by natural sources or they created it. Either way, they swore an oath not to tell the humans. They wanted them all wiped out, every single one of them. They swore an oath. 
I, now, and the thing was, Anki swore this oath too, but he must have been just churning, you know, in his gut. Same with Isis, knowing they had created these beings, and now they have to watch them all get wiped out. I mean, that's that's gut wrenching to know that. You know, you kind of get attached to your <laughs> your offspring in a way. You know, I don't care if you, if it was through in vitro fertilization, it's still an offspring, right? Mm-hmm. So um, at this point, Anki's ordered to bring a flood. He uh, he refuses, but somehow it comes anyway. And he has sworn an oath not to say anything to this. The great Anunna is what uh, Enlil called themselves. We, the great Anunna, swore an oath that no life was to survive this flood. Well, now you know that, and Enki had gotten somebody out, and it turned out to be it was none other than his son, the king of Sharupak, who, after 600 years, was, was there in the Bible. If you go read about the king of Sharupak, it was Noah. Okay, when the flood right. came. Yeah, exactly. So it was exactly the same being, and he had lots of other names. He was called Atrahasis in the Atrahasis account, which he was telling the story, which is terrific. Uh, he was known as Theosudra in some of the Sumerian documents, and he was known as Utnapishtim in the Gilgamesh account. All the same name. So all of a sudden, the idea of somebody having more than one name, let's just do that right now. <laughs> G-O-D. How many names of God are there in the various cultures in the world? Right, too many. Matt, there are so many. So which one is the right one? And nobody asks themselves. It's just the three-letter G-O-D one that got put into the Hebrew account. Well, guess what? <laughs> Enlil was the head of the council, and he was also the chief deity of the city of Ur. Hello? He was the, he was the, patri- he was the one who set up Abram to be the patriarch of the three world's religions. Okay, and they call it. him Yahweh, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I got ahead of myself a little bit. Yeah, let, let's, go, <laughs> let's do this flood thing. Everybody likes that. Okay, so here comes the flood. Enki tells uh, Octrahasis, king of Sharupak, guess what? Flood's coming. You're in Enlil's territory now. My territory is now in Africa. You got to tell all the council elders and stuff. You're leaving. Build a boat. And you're going to get out. And the reason you're going to tell him you're getting out is because you no longer have favor with my half brother in this region. And it worked. And that's what he—that's what he decided to tell him. Now, Enki was a scientist and a geneticist, and they'd been here for thousands of years, thousands of years. <laughs> they had probably gotten every sample of every useful plant, f- flora, fauna you could imagine as a laboratory. <laughs> aggregation of all this genetic material in Aridu. That's where they probably had it, because that was his first place where he was. He was there 5,000 years, by the way, before Enlil ever came to the Earth. So that was 400, so 450,000 years ago, Enki came. 445,000 years, Enlil came afterward to help bolster this mission. Wow. Okay, you with me? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> okay, so now uh, the flood comes. Um, Atrahasis gets in his... In his uh, seed bank vessel along with an Anunnaki navigator that Enki appointed. Um, they head for the IP point from Sapar, which is their, which is an initialization point for aviators out there that know what I'm talking about. It establishes the vector, the approach path vector to your landing site, and it's aligned with the runway. Well, that's what Mount Ararat was for Sapar. Okay, they could be they could be down in Mesopotamia and see this high peak and align it with where the middle of the Tigris and Euphrates were. That's why they had a landing strip there. Okay, so he was so Atrahasis was sent there on this boat. They, probably because the tsunami that came in would have washed it up to the highest threshold of the Zagros Mountains in South Turkey, and then it would have washed back over, back out. So they were probably hoping to, when they got washed in, is to get caught on the high ground there in order to survive. Anyway, apparently he was successful. Uh, Atrahasis' family, you know the story of Noah. He gets out of his ark and. Uh, Lands there, the water starts uh, receding, and he builds a little altar to venerate the person that saved him. Turns out it was his father, Enki. Well, about that time, the Anunnaki are in low Earth orbit, surveying the flood damage. When uh, when Enlil sights uh, Atrahasis, or Noah, and his family on Ararat, and it turns out, I think there were glaciers at that time, and it looks like the landing on Ararat ended up uh, melting the glaciers and, it, and the the actual arc ended up uh, about 13 or 30 miles south of where it originally was. And people have found it. People want to go on and look at uh, the documentaries on Noah's Ark. They truly have found it, in my opinion. Yeah, I've seen those. I was curious about about the validity of that. Yeah, yeah, that's a true story. Uh, it just turns oh, yeah. out that, you know, it was in a glacier and it was sliding down uh, um, 
the mountain there, and it, you know, and, and it, they may have called it slightly different how the mountains were named than what the locals ended up calling it. Who knows? But uh, I think uh, the, the mountain just to the south of there, I think it's within, it's within 30 miles of there. They believe that's where the glacier ended up depositing it. And from my uh, experience and all the documentaries as I've watched, I'm quite convinced they that's it, and they found it. Anyway, right so it, it lands there. Uh, they've got a seed bank to reestablish life. They do that. All uh, domesticated cattle and seed grains that genetically have been looked at came from the Fertile Crescent for the most part. Now, there, I know there's some other grains around the world that ended up being added uh, initially, afterwards, but the, the ones they were using at the time have been genetically shown to be about 12,000 years ago come from the Fertile Crescent. Well, this co coincides with the last ice age when the flood was, so this all made sense to me scientifically, right? Okay, so at this point... Uh, we find out that uh, Enki's son, the king of Shuruapak, is uh, uh, is actually Atrahasis, and Enlil finds out that he's his son too, and that's why he saved him. So they they kind of go at it, Enki and Enlil, describe, discussing this oath they took and that Enki violated it by saving him, and he convinces him, you know, hey, we need some workers here to provide for us. Who's going to do it? We're going to we're here by ourselves now. Everybody's dead. Look at them all in the mud. You know, and Isis at this point, she's going through some ritual to have a necklace made to commemorate uh, all these dead humans. And it's really a devastating scene when you huh. really find out the real story of Noah's blood. So so at this point, uh, short time afterwards, um, uh, a couple of the Anunnaki, um, I don't know, demi, some of them are demigods, some of them are full on. They decide to take uh, the Sadapa to Nibiru to meet Anu because... Uh, you know, they've created a new being on this foreign planet that they're doing this mission on, and I'm sure he's quite interested in knowing what the design constraints are, what are we in for, what are the problems going to be, you know, how do we know we can control them, all that. So Enki sends a tablet along with Ningshida and uh, his other son, Demuzi. I always get confused about who Demuzi belongs to after reading the accounts. He ended up marrying a gal named Ereshignal, who was the was the guardian of the underworld, if you will. So, And she was an Enlilite, so I was like, hmm, okay, I can, let me figure this out. But... Uh, Anyway, so Demuzi and Ningshida accompany uh, the Adam to meet Anu. They give him a tablet. Ningshida secretly gives it to him, says, here's the design constraints for my father. Here's what they're doing. 120-year lifespan. Gave him intelligence. Uh, that's it. Anu sends him back, keeps Demuzi on Nibiru for some reason, uh, and later promises to send seeds with Demuzi back to the Fertile Crescent where uh, it looks like the ewes and uh, domesticated cattle showed up. Okay. So those okay. came from Nibiru. Isn't that trippy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that account of uh, the Adapa being taken to Nibiru was so important to me. And you can read a really good version of it in the Lost Book of Enki from Sitchin. There are other accounts as well. But uh, the idea that uh, we had a destiny that was determined by, by this being Anu and was going to be I don't know, managed by this other being named Ningshida, who turns out to be Thoth. I mean, this is this is absolutely the genesis of our holographic simulator, Will, if you will, <laughs> in determining what what our constraints are in operating in this order of reality and how it is we're supposed to be used. So, I mean, that that knowledge in and of itself is so important to the story, knowing that Ningshida played a key fundamental role in our management and an enslavement he was to be our teacher mm -hmm. so i don't think he was to be able to teach us the way enki taught the adapa that got taken to Aridu to the temple but they he was to be our teacher on this in this simulation to evolve our consciousness to the place where the anunnaki found favor with us because apparently you know imagine you create a genetic offspring don't train it anything to do but hard physical labor. You don't tell it anything about its origins or anything else. Imagine the quagmire of screwed up thinking that can end up with <laughs> <laughs> just like we have now, right? I mean, it's yeah, just, we're not God that is far off. You're God, and we have the truth, and therefore we're going to kill you, and it just goes on and on and on. As you right. know, everybody knows the truth about it. There's no mystery. <laughs> so, anyway, hey, at this point, I want to bring in something that you mentioned in your script. Okay. Um, I was listening to Anthony Sanchez recently, and he was a kind of a technologist in the in California, like I was, who ended up on this Anunnaki story. And he got his story. Uh, he was definitely a blogger and keeping track of uh, ancient astronauts and the and the Anunnaki and such. So he knew the story. But then he met uh, 
some uh, military uh, secret source who uh, gave him the lowdown in a, in a private meeting about what's going on here now. In that account, he indicated that he believed the Ajiji were the alien greys. Right. And I took I kind of took exception with that, and here's why. Um, when we look at the um, depictions of the Watchers and their offspring, which became the Nephilim, uh, we know that they were humanoid looking, even though they got really tall after apparently about 600 years. There was something in their DNA relative to their existence on this planet that after a certain period of time, and Paul Hellyer verifies this, and so does Charles Hall. I'm sorry, Charles Hall does, and not Paul Hellyer. And he, that after about 600 years, they start growing quite large, and this is their downfall somewhat, and that their internal organs can't keep up with their skeletal structure. And this is something in their genetic code that causes this. Well, look at look at uh, King Gilgamesh. He was huge compared to the populace. <laughs> they showed him wrestling with two lions like they were kittens. Right. That's how big he was. And you know, in the, in the depiction, he he towered over all the other people. Well, that in the Bible, it talks about. Um, him becoming a Gaborum. Well, a Gaborum is a giant, so there was something in their DNA that was causing this. Well, guess what? They weren't alien gray looking. Okay, They looked just like we did. It just so happens that they had advanced genetics. Right so on. the Watchers, I believe, looked a lot like the Anunnaki. Uh, it just so happens that, and they were considered fellow gods, too. Okay, They called them gods. So uh, I... I think the – and I'll just put a fork in it right now, and I could be out of, out of bounds. But I truly think the, uh, the greys are a creation of the Anunnaki, but they were used to replace uh, various, I don't know, specific functions, whether it's gathering genetic material from cows or, or working with the military to release uh, advanced technology in, in lieu of – in trade for underground bases. Mm -hmm. You know, they're kind of their – their, they're chimera agents, just like we were, except they have different functions. And they, they were probably designed to look crazy so that they didn't lead them back to what the Anunnaki truly looked like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it could of, be. Yeah, totally. So anyway, they could be from another uh, another uh, extraterrestrial location, too. Uh, there were several of them here. So I'm not too sure, too sure, but they don't seem to have the same agenda as the Anunnaki. That's for sure. Okay, and I think okay. I think they're still here. And and Anthony goes into detail about these be the the grays anyway, uh, and in the base in Dulce, New, New Mexico. And I won't steal any of his thunder. And I hope people <laughs> do support him, just like they do me. But uh, he's got some really great interviews talking about the grays and some of their their agenda. And uh, apparently, he according to him, the Anunnaki were trying to kill them off, and they gave him some gene some. Some uh, disease like Sarupa or Saku disease, just like they did the humans, and then uh, exiled them to New Mexico, to, uh, where they ended up living underground. To and they thought they would die off. Well, they didn't. Wow. That, that's it. That's his story. Okay. So interesting. So anyway, it's very interesting, though. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I do not think the Ajiji were the were the Greys. Okay. So are there are there any Ajiji left? Uh, this is an interesting question. In the Lost Book of Enoch, these watchers uh, that took on, I don't know, they took human wives for themselves, 200 of them under Azazel's uh, uh, leadership, uh, they, uh, they got a, a severe sentencing, which I truly to this day still don't understand. They were sentenced to be completely destroyed according to Thoth, Enoch, <laughs> Ningshida, who's telling the story, by the way, at the end times, because they contacted him to run liaison with Anu to get them pardoned. He, he was the messenger, okay, back and forth. Ning Shida, remember Mercury, Hermes, the messenger god? He's right. the same being. Yeah, yeah. So he comes back with this bad news that, no, you guys aren't going to get pardoned. You're going to be thrown, uh, energy's going to be recycled at the end time. So, so keep that in mind. Imagine there are some beings who have been trapped on this, in, this, in this simulation, in this quarantine simulation. They can't get out because of their constructs, probably because they were created by the Anunnaki too, and they're to, they're to die here. And here we are, the, close to the end times, assuming that's true. Of course, every generation has said that, but uh, yeah. we have some pretty good indications this time, and we can go over those. Anyway, suppose they're trapped here, and they realize, hey, we're going to be recycled. <laughs> we're going to take as many of you with us as we can. So uh, I truly think that some of those showed up in uh, some of the, I don't know, jihadist organizations around the world. 
Hmm, that's so, an interesting. Idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because 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 in the first Gulf War, which was interesting to me, I almost went to it. I got out of the military flying uh, attack helicopters in 1989. The Gulf War started in '91, so my friends went there and they were looking through the telescopic sight units of Apaches while uh, the vehicles were leaving the Kofji Road out of Kuwait after all that carnage. As a matter of fact, one of them fired the first missile that stopped that convoy before the Joint Air Attack Team mission was done. And I, I actually ended up in observation helicopters by the time I was 25. I realized, yeah, I had a lot of testosterone, and I was <laughs> trained to kill a commie for mommy. But guess what? I woke up. I became a conscientious objector. I didn't want to do that. Amen. And I, I couldn't wait to get out. I couldn't wait to get out, actually. Uh, I'm very lucky I did, I did not have to slaughter massive numbers of humans. Because <laughs> I, sure, I sure was surrounded by the weapons to do it. <laughs> yeah, jeez. Yeah. So, uh, anyway... Um, what year are we looking at now? The floods happened, and, and we're not quite obviously up to the writing of the tablets, but do you have any idea what type of uh, year we're looking at? Well, so, so keep this in mind. It was 600 years after the breeding program, which started 200,000 years ago when they first wiped people out. Okay, There were four major floods, according to the, the chief priest of Sais in Egypt. We think of only one of them. Okay, but and there were many minor ones too in that area. So, so, t so what we know is about the last uh, ice age. It was about uh, twelve thousand five hundred years ago when the when the major last devastating flood came through. And so, what we believe is that that was the uh, flood of Noah. But then you go, wait a second, how could that be? How could Noah be that old? That's not possible. Well, guess what? In the Atrahasis account on Mount Ararat, when Enlil finally conceded to Enki that he was going to let him live, he, he gave him the ritual, the right, the access, whatever it was, to eternal life on the spot. It's in the Atrahasis account. Guess what? Noah's still around. How do you like that? Unless he was, <laughs> unless he was killed, his DNA is, is such that his telomeres don't decay, and he got eternal life just like the Anunnaki had. I wonder what he thought of Russell Crowe's depiction. I bet he rolled up. I bet he just slapped his knee and said, "That's the most dastardly misrepresentation of my story I've ever seen." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what I think. Uh, so anyway, you know the whole idea of the, the the nursery rhyme, all these animals going onto one boat. I mean, that's not right, even right. that's not even possible. <laughs> I mean, come on. But bringing the genetic material from them, now that's intelligent. And mm -hmm. that's what they that makes a lot more sense. But, I mean, even as, mu as much as 80 years ago, people might not have even thought of that. Well, that's true because they were fed this, this Hebrew distorted account in the, in the Torah that was completely wrong. It was designed to placate this monotheistic, calling himself God, almost head of the Anunnaki Council, genocidal murderer. <laughs> Well said. So, uh, so get us up to like Egypt, because that's I think the as far back as most people are pretty familiar with, or or Sumer, either one. But um, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. We got some ground to cover still. Well, let's keep in mind that there was a lot. There was multiple histories in Mesopotamia. They started out four hundred fifty thousand years ago, set up a Ridu, eventually set up seven pre-diluvial cities or so that were serving their various functions: metallurgy, mining. Um, Sharupak was a health center. Bad Tabira was the um, ore processing, Sapar was the landing site, Nippur was their mission control headquarters, and Ur also was a religious center, too. So Enlil showed up at Nippur and Ur, both of them. Okay. So how do we get to Egypt? Well, we knew in the casting of the lots in the Atrahasis that Enki was given all of Africa, which includes the northern part where Egypt is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he clearly went down and followed the same model he had done in Mesopotamia, following where the rivers dump into the, into the ocean, because that's where all the fertile soil is, and you got a fresh source of water all the time. So he chose the, the Egyptian Nile, uh, right at the head end of the delta, where uh, the Egyptian civilization got put up. Now, first of all, let's get some timing stuff straightened out. <laughs> if, if they built Eridu 450,000 years ago, and then built... Uh, several pre-diluvial before 12,500 years ago, cities uh, in southern Iraq, and then they were destroyed. Well, where does, uh, where does uh, the, the Giza Pyramid and the Sphinx come in, the two most famous ones, and all the other civilization along the Nile? Huh? Well, what we have some evidence to show, and if you go with the, the Egyptian curator, they'll tell you, oh, no, it's only 3,100 years ago that Egypt uh, was, the Egyptian civilization was established. Mm-hmm. Well, we know in 3800 BCE, Eridu was reestablished. 
we already know it, it existed 450,000 years ago. So after multiple floods covered with mud, they rebuilt on sites that they probably could get back access to the foundation. Nation stones, uh, hope, hoping that they got another long run before the next flood. You know, finally it looks like they gave up. They got tired of that and moved up to higher ground. <laughs> uh, oh, Egypt! How we get to Egypt? Okay, so yes. in the casting of the lots, en Enki got Egypt, and so the very first dynasty of Egypt, according to Manetho, was ruled for nine thousand years by the first god. The first dynasty was all gods, meaning they were all the Anunnaki purebreds. They weren't demigods or offspring of the Anunnaki and, and the primitive workers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the first god of Egypt was P T A H. He served in the first dynasty for nine thousand years. That was Enki. He set up Egypt. Okay. Okay. Now let's go. Let's go back to the Sumerian account or the Sumerian kings list. We, we can go through just the first nine rulers, and it ends up around 240,000 years. And each one, or several of the first ones, served eight shars, which turns out to be 28,800 years. That's a long time. Damn. Damn. So all of a sudden, you think about a 120-year lifespan being like us, going, looking at them, going, you dudes live a long time. Do you yeah. ever die? We <laughs> thought they were immortal in the Greek gods, right? They yeah. all viewed their gods as immortal. Well, now you know why. <laughs> Yeah, great point. They had different genetics than we did. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you know, while we're talking about that, we might as well bring up the 2009 three scientists that got their Nobel Peace Prize for discovering uh, the telomeres. When they decay is what causes aging. And if you can stop that, you stop aging. And all the longevity hounds in the world uh, really got on board with that and said, wow, we can live forever now. <laughs> and I thought about that and I was like, wow, you know, maybe they designed us with these short lifespans because we got so little time. And so much to get accomplished, we just got to get it done. Matt, you know, time, work expands to fill the time you have available. So if right. you're trying to evolve your consciousness and get out of the simulator, and you give them 600 years, you know, you're 200 years into it. Well, I'll be, do, I'll be through with my martinis and my hedonistic lifestyle another couple hundred years. Then I'll get working <laughs> on that. <laughs> right? Right. But if you give 120 years and it's really short, guess what? <laughs> they they got to they gotta evolve fast or they get recycled, and, and we'll talk about that now. Right. I was wondering what you thought about how uh, reincarnation ties into this. Well, let's go back to the atrahasis. If Enki could kill a being, take its energy, put it in another body, and create our consciousness, our archetypal consciousness for us, which he did, uh, all of a sudden you realize this being is... Uh, has a relationship to energy and matter that we don't understand, but if you can do that, guess what? You can create a container anywhere and put energy in it and make it do whatever you want. And that's what we are. We are their slaves. We are here to do their mission. And the Sumerians had no issue with that. They knew this, okay? They knew they were genetically designed to do the Anunnaki functions, and they didn't have a problem with it. It's us who thought we were free and living in the, not living in a box and... You know, got a constitution with amendments that aren't followed by the president at effing all. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, we're free. You landed the free home of the brave. Well, how stupid is that? Right. Are you are you completely a moron? <laughs> there's, there's no freedom. Anytime they want, they can go, yeah, you didn't pay, pay your taxes. You're going to jail. <laughs> so, so you're anyway. So well, I, I digress. But well, right. I mean, wow, we had to really go through the story in that type of detail just for the context for you know the rest of this conversation but it is a very detailed story you definitely know your stuff and it can get confusing for people because some of the names we're not familiar with or you know they change when you get to sumar they change when you get to greece they change again when you get to rome but exactly but once you know that and you see that and you characterize just one of them and by the way we didn't even have to guess guess who told us their names across culture so we wouldn't have to guess it was isis herself Mm -hmm. And then she had a Stella in Rome that I personally saw, and you can find this on the internet, where she gives you her different names in different cultures. <laughs> and you're like, oh, that was the mother of humanity that stuck her neck out to do that. How about that? Man. Anyway, so, <laughs> so well, okay, the in vitro, in vitro fertilized mother. But she had many children with Enki, by the way, too. Not in right vitro on. fertilized ones. Yeah. <laughs> So I wanted to double back just a little bit. This this control mechanism that you've mentioned and have alluded to a couple times, you mentioned its connection to the electromagnetic spectrum. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Okay. Well, first of all, I want you to understand the construct of the brain. We have three different layers of our brain through our probably genetic augmentations, the latest of which is a neocortex. Okay. 
You've got this mammalian and a reptilian layer as well. Well, all of a sudden, you realize that, you know, well, look at a reptile. It can take light into its pineal gland and derive enough sensation of this threshold to color its skin to absorb the right amount of radiation for energy. That's amazing. Right. So the pineal gland is its closed-loop feedback system for regulating its temperature and its energy. Okay, so what I'm leading up to is all of a sudden there's, there's an interaction between energy and matter, electrical beings, biological beings like us. We're electrical beings. I mean, look, look, at, the, uh, look at modern science and all the instrumentation that's looked at us. We're, we're, we can be characterized in terms of frequency. Mm-hmm. Our vi- visual range, our auditory range, our vocal range, and our EEG range relative to our heart rate. I mean, these are frequencies, okay? So we're electrical beings. I just demonstrated to you in the autrahesis that Anki, <laughs> this chief scientist from Nibiru, clearly understood enough about energy matter to take energy out of one being and put it into another one. Wow! Think about that. Think about that. So Power. you're a container that he can, he can put energy into. Okay, so now let's think about that model, energy and matter. You're a container. There's energy that can go into you. How is it stored? How is it interface to you such that you could potentially be controlled or inter- interfaced to by the Anunnaki. Well, let's start with uh, our brain waves. We can go delta, theta, alpha, beta. That's uh, about a half a hertz up to 20 hertz. In our, and you can look at this on any monitor to see that that's our brain wave frequency. Okay? Mm-hmm. We know that there are various perceptions of reality that are correlated with brain wave frequency. And I hope everybody gets a chance to read Robert Monroe's book, Journeys Out of the Body. He... he found out that if you're in between this awake and sleeping state and you keep your mind awake, focused on something, let the body go to sleep, but there's, you know, all of a sudden you start changing brainwave frequency and it's some pretty bizarre stuff, including separating your energy from your body. And this isn't uh, new. I mean, this has been going on since, uh, gosh, when I was 17, I read that book and it turned, it changed my life hmm. along with many other people. And, and he went to the full limits hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times doing this, documenting it, scientifically monitoring it, setting up an institute, inviting other people to come try it. And it's a worldwide phenomenon. There's so many people that have experienced their energy apart from their body. We shouldn't be surprised that the electromagnetic spectrum energy is, it is neither created nor destroyed. It only changes state. That means it can be in your body or out of your body and operating in a different state or frequency, okay? So frequency to me is dimension. Of course, I'm an electrical engineer, and that's why I think that way. <laughs> so all of a sudden you realize, wow, all these weird things that happen in the electromagnetic spectrum can happen in my brain. Well, think about a radio signal, okay? It's got a carrier frequency. It's at one frequency. You modulate data on it that's at a much less frequency, not to exceed the Nyquist rate. And then this gets sent through an antenna and travels all through space. Well, guess what? It hits all your radio antennas, hits your brain, everywhere else. Okay. Now think about them modulating a signal onto another extreme low frequency that falls into delta, theta, alpha, beta in your brain waves. And they decide to broadcast a whole message to all the humans go, you're all worthless pieces of garbage and I want you all to kill each other. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Listen, I'm not kidding. The, The state of humanity in their basic thinking is very destructive. And this yeah. has been sh- shown by many people who have researched this, that like, you know, all the teenagers who end up being suicidal and stuff, how come they're not having happy thoughts? This is worldwide, by the way. It's not just, it's not just America. It's built so, in. Yeah, so think about uh, mind control and frequency and, uh, and all this stuff that goes on with uh, the subliminal messages and media and stuff. We know the Germans have been doing it for mind control and propaganda since World War II. Well, Walt Disney figured that out, and he used it real good. He liked that. Yeah, that's actually what I was getting at. It was, uh, I looked it up real quick, but it's, you know, natural. Apparently, we resonate at 432 hertz naturally, and in the 50s, they changed all music to be 440 hertz as the standard, and there's a lot of speculation that that kind of screws with our, you know, just screws with us. It screws with our resonance in some way. Yeah, well, let, try, try this on for a second. What do you, what's your basic average heart rate, about 60 beats a minute, something like that? Sure. That's 60 hertz. What's the refresh rate for AC electricity? 60 hertz. There you go. <laughs> so you could use the wires in the wall 
to monitor the heart rate of a being if you had the telemetry ability to monitor that signal off the, pow the power grid infrastructure, every being. Wow. That's a primitive way to do it, but now <laughs> they've got much more advanced ways to do it now. I mean, we've had satellite technology since the 60s. Do you realize that? It can do facial recognition and voice recognition. Right. So imagine taking it the next step further in the electromagnetic spectrum and going, hey, wh what chakra is that being evolved to down there? Is he in danger of waking up and revolting against uh, the powers that be? Let's take a look. Up oh, this pocket over here near Boulder, Colorado, and... San Francisco, I don't know what's going on with them. Maybe they're taking drugs, but a bunch of them are waking up. Look at the color of their chakras. There's some that are even in their third one, their fifth. <laughs> wow. See what I'm Listen, so we're a little color blips all mm -hmm. along uh, this the surface of the earth that can be detected with satellite imagery to determine where your consciousness is. And then you just cause a little disaster for that area. Well, yeah. I mean, you can send good and bad based on where somebody is in their mission. And now you know, based on Snowden's uh, discussions, that uh, they've been monitoring all your electronics. Well, well, guess what? What if they've been – you're a, you're a telemetry being. You were designed as a slave to do work. You think they didn't build in a way to monitor what independent thoughts you may be able to have to determine if you your intent was to rebel? <laughs> Come on! That was their primary reason for creating a replacement worker for the oh, GGs man. because they, they, they were putting down a rebellion. So, guess what? I'm in trouble. You're a meat modem. They've been monitoring every thought you have, everything that you... Well, as long as your thoughts are monitored, that's what's important. We essentially are nothing more than a meat modem. We, all of our senses are combined to create a perception of what we see outside of us in this simulator, a very limited range, by the way, okay, that ends up in a brainwave signal. Let me let me be clear on our our limitations. We were given eyes to see from four to seven hundred nanometers. Okay, what can an owl see? We can't even see at night. An owl <laughs> and most animals can see in the dark. We can't. <laughs> right. Uh, what can, what can we hear? Zero to twenty kilohertz. Wow, dogs hear better than we do. <laughs> We have a very limited set of sensors, is what I'm telling you. Right. These would be the kind of things that were built into us when we were engineered. Well, if you were engineered to perceive the world in a particular way, then the sensors would be designed that way, that you only get to see what they let you see. Yeah. In other words, imagine, imagine they could exist in 900 nanometers in near-infrared. Okay? Mm -hmm. But you could only see the 700 nanometers. Well, they could be standing right next to you as infrared beings reflecting that light and you can't even see them man so it's that it's that ridiculous on how enslaved we are with our, our sensors okay so now keep that in mind when you're going could we really be in a holographic simulator you damn right <laughs> if they designed your sensors that way and limited them so much you're you're you <laughs> that's your enslavement is your sensation of what's outside of you right that makes sense and um so the big takeaway from the Anunnaki story, the reason we laid such groundwork is to really drill home that not only the details of this engineering, but also that the main battle here seems to be between Anki and Enel. And Anki tends to be, you know, the more caring creator, and uh, Enel obviously is more aggressive. He doesn't really care about people. He wouldn't mind if we all died. So to bring this into modern times or th throughout history within the elites, they seem to worship still in some form Enel, right? Well, that's <clears throat> that's correct. And this is really sneaky. And I had to go up. I had to go look up Isaiah fourteen twelve. I believe it was. Let me look real quick in order to pin down a name that's been the most elusive to so many people. And that is the, that's the name of uh, Lucifer, right? Right. So this is, this is really crazy because uh, this is the real key. We know the name Enlil became Yahweh, Jehovah, El Shaddai, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? He's the one that made the deal with Abram, his general, out of the city of Ur to go take Levantine away from uh, Enki's offspring. And then uh, poor Ishmael and Hagar, his mother, the Egyptian, remember the connection to Enki? He, he was, he, they call it, he called Hagar Abram's handmaiden. He was a slave, okay? <laughs> this Egyptian slave. He has a kid with him and sends him packing, okay? Well, Enel made a promise to 
for them that they would end up having a prolific nation of people as numerous as the stars, just like you do with Abraham. Well, now look what they're doing to each other. <laughs> oh, he didn't tell him he was going to bid him against each other and destroy him just for fun. So uh, I got lost where you wanted me to go on this. Well, you know, these shadowy organizations, they mask the entities they follow. But do we know historically who's been following who? Oh, right, 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 right. I was... Oh, I was sne- I was sneaking up on the name Lucifer, and I, for some reason he probably smacked me in the head. <laughs> anyway, so in, in Isaiah 14, 12, in the King James Bible, I want you to hear this. How art thou fallen, fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Okay. I mean, if you infest them with a Saku disease and Saruper disease, cut off the food and water, yeah, you'd probably weaken the nations, yeah. Okay, so keep that in mind. But then you go to the New International Version. This is, you know, the editorial oversight of Enlil's group to uh, hide who he is. That's the only reference, by the way, in the King James Bible to Lucifer. And I'm telling right now, it's Enlil, okay? Mm -hmm. Now look what happens in the NIV Bible. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star. That's a replacement right there for Lucifer. That was not in the King James, son of the dawn. You've been cast down to the earth, you who once laid the nations low. Okay, so what I'm telling you is there's only one occurrence of his name that accidentally slipped through. The rest of the places he calls himself God, okay, but this slipped through. He wasn't, this was another name for Enlil that he, they did not want you to know. Hmm. The Illuminati venerate Lucifer. That's that's a fact. There's no question about that. The Catholic Church venerates Lucifer and calls his son G J E S U S. This is a fact. They do this in their homily during Easter. The last two years, for those of you who want to go look on the on the internet, he did this and they did it in Latin and they specifically said Lucifer and his son Jesus. Okay, Jesus. By the way, it was not the real, not the real person who actually gave the humans the way out of the simulator. His other name was Ningshida. I just told you that earlier because he was appointed by Anu to be our teacher, and he had many incarnations. And Edward Casey did a great job in a table talking about the many incarnations of Ningshida. One of them was Yeshua as Enki's son that went into the Levantine to wake up the humans under Enlil's priests that were there, the Jewish priests and the Roman authorities that were there, beating down the humans in this area that used to belong to Enki. Now it belonged to Enlil because he now has Levant, right? Mm -hmm. So the whole idea of routing the Levant and getting Enki's offspring out of there using Abram, Abram to conduct genocide, then give the land to one of his sons, what what an abomination. (laughs) You know, anyway, so, so, so who are these? Who are they? Okay, so now I just told you that this other name you show up that's showing up in the music industry and everywhere, this Luciferian Illuminati. Okay, the Illuminati were affiliated with the, uh, with uh, a secret organization in, in Europe that supposedly started in 1776 under Adam Weishaupt. Right. It actually started much, much earlier, in my opinion, and it had to do with the Catholic church and their papacy was mixing religion and authority under their rulership, <clears throat> even though they had a czar, to uh, route this secret organization that was dedicated to the Ankeites, and I believe that was the Masons. You read their original charter, their secret doctrine was to be a part of the rising of the new Atlantis and set up a new this new Atlantis, not a new world order, but a new Atlantis, Okay, because Anki was the chief deity of Atlantis. So this was so uh, important to me to follow them from Greece back to the United States to pin them down. So what, what did we know about Atlantis that was so crucial? We get, we get taught uh, in school that you know, democracy started in Greece, and that's about what we get. From, and then the, their mythology about their gods, all, it's all BS, right? That's what we get told. But the reality is Enki was the chief uh, deity of Atlantis, according to the Critias from Plato. And he uh, was very, very honorable, very righteous, and he wasn't a destroyer. The, the character qualities that he had the people trying to ascribe to were fantastic. They were so amazing, and his society was so advanced and civilized that Solon, the wisest man of Greece, heard about the, them, and he wanted to model his government after them. Okay, that's why he looked into it. Okay, so um, from, uh, from Greece... Uh, and the sinking of Atlantis, which uh, this is a really interesting story that most people don't know. 
right at the end of the, the Critias play, uh, transcript, where Plato stopped his story, he didn't finish it, he talked about what went wrong on Atlantis. And this is a message for um, everybody, especially America, especially America, since the new Atlantis was designated to rise in Washington, D.C., and uh, you can go look at all the symbology there, it's all there. But the fact that uh, it's being destroyed is very telling. And people want to know, why is that happening? Why are we losing our sovereignty? Why is our constitution being trampled? Well, why, why, why? Why, why is the DHS militarizing the police? And on and on and on. Right. Well, it, it looks like a new world. Or actually, it's an old world order that we've seen before. Uh, uh, a tyrannical beatdown is what's arising. Well, <laughs> right. you, well, ask yourself, why? Well, at the end of the Critias, I'm going to tell you why. Apparently, after a long time of the people, and, they, and there were demigods there because Cleto, uh, Enki's wife, was a normal primitive worker. So he had kids with him, had ten of them. Atlas was one of them. So he was a demigod of Enki. His, um, uh, the daughter of Atlas and his wife was Maya. You know, Maya Majesta. She shows up in the Greek, uh, in the Greek discussions of the uh, of the Greek gods. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that Hermes was the offspring of Zeus and Maya. So all of a sudden, you realize now his incarnation is he's bridging the gap between the Enlites and the Enkiites <laughs> in his role as Hermes in Greece. That is amazing. He ended up on the Olympian Council, too. Hmm. This is the being Ningshita. Okay? So all of a sudden now, we're starting to talk about some names that show up in, in Samaria that also show up in the Greek pantheon. Okay? And not all of them, because there were the Titans and the Olympians. The Olympian Council was headed by Zeus, who we now know as Enlil. Okay? Mm -hmm. And some of the beings on that council, many of them were affiliated with him. There were some Enkiites on there, but not many. The Enkiites were affiliated with uh, the, the Titans, or the Atlanteans, who was part of this Oceanic League. And the Olympians won the war against the Titans, enslaved the remnants in the city of Tartarus, and most of them died there. Okay, mm -hmm. So... So now all of a sudden you realize Enlil, this bureaucratic commander, willingly did the destructive thing again, reasserted control because he had lost control on the council in 2000 BC. One of Enki's sons took it. So this back and forth, back and forth on the Anunnaki council, rank of 50, lord of the earth, is what predicates what us humans in this simulator get to experience. And the last 2,000 years has been run by an, Enki, uh, by an Enlilite, and we've seen nothing but war and destruction. Tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> right. Man, fascinating stuff, Gerald. Um, and yeah, we yeah. Well, <laughs> well, listen, something really important happened this weekend. I know we're about to fi finish up, but I wanted to say something about what's happening in world events because I know it's very disturbing with uh, Ebola and and all the different wars and things that are going on and the idea of these jihadists uh, having 22 different training posts in the United States mm -hmm. preparing for, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they, you know... Uh, they they're they're all over. Go look up uh, uh, some of the the places that they've occupied. Uh, I mean, it's just crazy. They call them I don't know these little cities that they've set up. And oh no, we don't have any weapons. Oh no, we're not doing any uh, jihadist training here. So the so what's going on? You know the uh, according to the Illuminati, the Luciferian tradition, they're setting up a very very negative culling to push all of the uh, world's constructs to the most negative place they can. This is the 95% culling that they want. Okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so you see it in the media, you see it in the government, you see it in the military, you see it in the universities. It's happening everywhere. Everybody's having their money stole, getting enslaved, take their property away, no more sovereignty, all your rights are gone, right? <laughs> well, this is part of what's happening right before uh, this culling. And by the way, this year, on the Georgia Guidestones, some people will know yes. about that. Uh, this this year, a new little cube was put up there. Right, said, what's that about? It said 2014, meaning it's happening now. It's happening now. So listen, if we have a, and we just entered World War III officially this week, when the United States illegally went into Syria, no congressional approval, no UN approval, and are dropping bombs on people in Syria. This is the government that's out of control of the United States, okay? Well, who's doing this? <laughs> this is this is from those two beings occupying the underground base. Listen, they had a contract. They traded these advanced military weapons for them with certain requirements attached to them. 
and they had expectations, and they're ah. fulfilling those right now, right now. Okay. Man. And remember, I mentioned ISIS's name getting smeared, Hermes nine thousand drone getting smeared with Israel, and Enki's symbol, the trident, getting smeared. Well, listen, I think the Enkiites are planning and plotting. They're absolutely the best world's chess players. And when they come out, they're going to pull the carpet out from under the New World Order. It's already happening. <laughs> it's already happening with Russia and China joining together. So there's an alternative world monetary system to the petrodollar that means nothing. It's already happening. So creation instruction happening at the same time. And uh, Man. I... And I truly believe that, unfortunately, if you're in the United States, you're in animals' territory right now. And just like in the Atrahasis, when the king of Sharupak decided he was in animals' in territory and he had to go to Enki's territory to survive, uh, that's what's happening in the United States. So you can pick up a gun and think you're going to fight these beings and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you're out of your mind. <laughs> You're out of your mind. You you pick up a gun, you've signed up to be destroyed, just like an alien versus predator. <laughs> Watch it again. Watch it again. <laughs> very insightful movie, that alien yes, versus predator. Yes, it was, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Man, well, very cool. It has been a real pleasure. Uh, always fascinated by the stories of man's oldest known writings, and to hear how it connects to modern day is just awesome to hear. 